All right, hello and welcome to the Unplayable Podcast. My name is Josh Shonafinger. I'm joined by Jack Painter and today we are very, very lucky to have Matt Renshaw from the Queensland State Cricket Team on to join us. And Matt, right off the bat, I believe congratulations are in order for what you posted on Instagram earlier this week. Yeah, thank you very much and, and thanks for, for having me today. It's um, Yeah, we're really excited. we got a, a little baby due in December, so we're really excited for that. And uh, talk us through, that's obviously contributed to the, the move back to the heat. Um, you must be excited about that and to get to spend time with uh, family and, and friends around the time of the birth of your first child. Yeah, definitely. Really, really grateful for the Adelaide Strikers and, and what they were able to do for us. Obviously, it's a, it's a tough time with when it's due. And um, yeah, being able to be home um, around that time and still managing to play some cricket was probably the big big decision for us um but yeah really really happy with how it's all gone and um yeah it's just very fortunate to be able to come back to the heat um now and and yeah and then a couple more years after that talk us through your your, your winter for somerset and matt you've you've dominated there you've got three centuries 250s and six wickets uh believe it or not uh, so you must head into the into the summer with a lot of confidence for queensland yeah, it was a really enjoyable summer over there. Um, playing a lot of cricket is always always good. Sometimes it, it can be a little a little tough on the body, but um, yeah, the being able to play a lot of Red Bull games over there um, was really a, a real blessing for us to to be able to play some cricket. Um, I know it's a lot better than standing in the in the cold doing running sessions and all that sort of thing. So um, being able to challenge myself against some of the best bowlers in England and, and, and the conditions there, learning about different conditions, learning about the ball. Um, probably the highlight was facing Simon Harmer at Essex in their notoriously spin-friendly conditions, um, being able to, to bat for a long time against him and play that challenge. I really enjoyed that. And we've noticed you've um, spent some time back up the order as well as an opener. Is that sort of where you see yourself heading long term or are you happy with the middle order? I'm not too fussed, really. Um, I know when I, when I was speaking to Somerset before I'd signed, it was sort of where where do you want me to bat? And and to be honest, any any game I go in, I'm not fussed about where I'm batting. I, I just try and look at the, the opportunity and the challenge that's going to be there. Um, they needed an, an opener, so it sort of fit me to go back up the top. But it was a little bit strange at the start, um, having not opened for a, for a couple of years in, in high, high, high form cricket. But... Um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the challenge of facing the new ball, um, especially early in April when there was a few little sticky green wickets that were <laughs> always a bit um, challenging, and you knew that a ball might have your name on it. But that was the, that's the the great part of opening is having that challenge. You're obviously right back on the the fringes of the the Aussie squad now, especially with you know the A tour to Sri Lanka. You um, included in the squad for the Pakistan Limited Over series. Where do you sort of see the opportunity there for yourself? Is it opening or is it in the middle order or is it just whatever chance comes up that might present itself in the, in the future? Yeah, uh, I think over the last couple of years, having batted in that middle order for, for Queensland and being quite successful, it, I feel like I can sort of fit in the side at, at any point. I know that if I bat in the middle order, I'm, I'm quite strong against spin and if I'm opening the batting, I can, I can deal with the new ball as well. So I'm not really too fussed about um, where I bat. That's what I think a lot of us at Queensland, we're sort of, we've got our top five all open the batting. So it's some only two get to do it. Um, and when you've got minus at three, that's, he's always going to take that spot. So um, we're all just fitting in around and, and we're not too fussed about where we're batting. It's more just trying to score runs and, and win games for Queensland. So we look at when we won the Shield a couple of years ago. I think all of us had, had scored 100 at one point in the year and we're all... Um, batting really well as a group so that's probably the most important thing all all the other stuff takes care of itself if you're if you're winning games and, and the team's going really well and have you been given any indication on what your role with the heat might be i mean kawaja and yourself are the two big inclusions um will you be up the top somewhere in the middle or a bit of both maybe um yeah i think a, a little bit of both um we've obviously fortunate to have a couple of um, really good overseas signings so um, you expect sort of um, one of them to be opening, one of them to be in the middle order and one of them to be in the middle lower order. So it sort of fits in 
in there depending on on the game situation but hopefully in that sort of three or four role um something that um i've struggled a little bit over the last few years was um the movement between different positions i think over the last three years i would have batted anywhere from one to six in t20 cricket throughout the years so looking for a bit more stability and i understand that I, i need to earn the right to to have that stability um but i feel like my game at the moment in in T20 cricket and, and one day cricket, especially, is sort of uh, growing and being in that number four role for Queensland and number three role for Queensland. It's been really enjoyable for the challenge for me. And talk us through what it was like playing with Peter Siddle during the winter. It was a lot better than playing against him, that's for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, he's, he's an incredible um, former. He's 39 years old or, or something like that, and he's still bowling 130 plus. Like nipping it around, nipping blokes off. Um, yeah, I think there was some statistic about he's taken like 700 first pass wickets or something stupid like that. And I think I think I've probably overtaken my batting with my fielding at the moment. I think I've taken a few more catches and he's got me out now. So <laughs> helping him either way in his um, in his exploits to try and get as many wickets as he can. But um, yeah, he was great for the Somerset group, especially the the bowling group when you lose a couple of those English test guys um, by a young bowling group and he really led the, led the uh, attack and, and I think he's working on that sort of um, the performance side and, and growing what he wants to do after his, his career finishes. We also noticed uh, while you are over there that um, you did a bit of sightseeing, Harry Potter World, for example. Talk us through what that was like to get over there. Yeah, yeah. Um, my wife and I love Harry Potter. Um, I've loved it. Probably loved it a lot more since I've sort of turned 18. It's, it's a strange one. Like, I was I was quite young when it first came out, and I obviously loved it all. But just the, I don't know what it is, but being able to go over there and went up to Scotland a couple of times, um, just going for drives, seeing some sights, and then the Harry Potter world was probably the big one as well. So, um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a really enjoyable thing for us to, to do, and... It gets us a little bit away from cricket, which is always a, an important thing, and, and getting to see see those sights was, was amazing. And Sid's is obviously not a fan of Harry Potter. I think he was in the F ones at, at Monaco when you were at uh, Harry Potter World. Yeah, we we had a, a couple of different sort of times where we had some time off. He'd go off and do F one things, and I was off Harry Potter World. Thing. It's um, probably a bit bit more of a, a difference than a, a thirteen year age difference. Maybe it's a bit more than that, but I don't. I don't. It's not for lack of trying. I'd have loved to be at the F one, but unfortunately, Pete could only get one ticket. Stiff, stiff. So, would you consider yourself a super fan of Harry Potter? I'm not quite like a. I won't go to King's Cross on the first of September and like do that. But I'll, I'll, um, I'll watch it. I, I like watching TV when I go to bed. I like listening to things when I go to bed. So. Um, if I'm away, I'll probably watch like a Harry Potter because I've seen it so many times. Um, makes me fall asleep. And when I'm at home, I'll just put my um, my headphones in and listen to Harry Potter audiobooks. It's just normal normal things that 26 year old men do. Um, <laughs> but I don't know whether that's because Stephen Fry's doing the audiobooks and they're quite soothing voice. But um, it's something that sort of developed into a bit of a routine for me. How many times? Do you reckon you've read the books? I think I'm up to about maybe seven or eight each book. I've listened to them a lot more. Um, since getting the audio books, it's, it's made it a lot easier. Like you just go for a drive and put the audio book on. Um, I remember I was trying to get Marnus into to reading them because he hadn't, um, he never read them or watched them as a kid. So when we were, um, we were out on, I think it was the COVID, the first COVID season, we were, we were all there and, we watched one of them. Um, Jimmy Pearson's also a big Harry Potter fan, so is Liz McGuire. So I think we were watching him one night. Minus came in, he's like, "What's this?" And so we made him go back. He's not the the greatest reader, I don't think. So he got the audio books um, and listened to him. But he he listened to him in like two and a half years. Like it took him ages to finish them. All. So I don't really know what he, he was really doing. He's like. He kept saying, oh, I need to be in this mindset to listen to Harry Potter. I'm like, what's every mindset? Just put it on while you're driving. So, um, 
yeah, we we got him got him hooked, and he was loving it, and he was kept talking to us about what was going on. He's like, oh, this happened, this happened, and we we're just like, yeah, just wait. And he's like asking questions, like trying to guess what's going to happen. We can't answer that because we don't want to ruin it. <laughs> I think you and many others trying to understand Manus's mindset. You'll be there a long, long time. Oh, no one can. <laughs> <laughs> did you uh, did you manage to do any other sightseeing while you were over there? Um, not as, not as much as we would have liked going to, to Sri Lanka. Um, we had a, a little bit of a break planned before, um, that was, that was announced. Um, I wasn't playing the T20s over there. So, um, I sort of would have had three, four weeks there, um, not playing any cricket. So we would have gone away somewhere there, but Sri Lanka, um, was a great opportunity. Um, we got down to, to Fistral Beach down in, in Cornwall for, sort of three or four days of, of relaxation. Um, went for a swim in the in the Atlantic Ocean. So I'm, I've ticked off a cup in another ocean that I've swum in. Um, and, yeah, it was it was nice to just get down there and have a, a few days off after um, some, some busy games. How many of the oceans have you now swum in? I've gone Pacific, Indian, Atlantic, so I only got Arctic to go. Do you reckon you'll be able to tick that one off? Yeah, it's... um. It's something that I never really thought about. Um, it's not like I woke up when I was 10 and go, I'm going to swim in every ocean. It's just <laughs> per chance I've managed to swim in three, but I think the Arctic is probably one of the toughest to get to. <laughs> so other than um, swimming in the, all the seas around the world, what are your other goals for this season that you want to try and tick off? Um, I've never been one for saying how many hundreds I want to get. Um, I just want to try and perform... In the, in the teams that I'm playing for. Um, I think building on a, a decent season last year and definitely in the one-day one day game is something that I've de- developed quite a quite a bit over the last few years. But um, probably trying to... We want, we want to try and win something. That's the, the end goal. So whether that's the, the Shield, that's the, the big one is trying to win the Shield and then the, the big bash and the one-day cup is, is something that I've never won either. So try and try and win one of them but I think as a team where we're definitely good enough you saw a couple of years ago we um, won the final by an inning so definitely able to do that and, and I think that's the, the big goal for everyone is trying to win the, the shield at the end of the year and it seems like there's some good good depth in the squad as well I know last year when Marnus and, and Uzi went out of the squad you had Jack Clayton come in and Sam Truloff and you know Jack Clayton scored 100 on his on his debut knock, so there must be a lot of positivity around that depth to cover those guys and potentially yourself if, if they go off at the back of the season for the India tour? Yeah, definitely. I think it's it's one of those tough ones because the last couple of years with COVID, we had a, a full strength, definitely a full strength batting lineup the whole, whole couple of years. And, and then with um, those guys leaving for Pakistan, it sort of gave some guys an opportunity. And I think those those guys really embraced that that challenge. It was a it was an interesting time. Like Jack scored 100 on debut, and then the the highs of that to then in our last game against Tasmania, we I think we lost by an innings, and uh, it was a, it was a tough sort of ball for for a few guys um, after having such highs at the start of the season. But I think it's our group, our job as a batting group and a, and a leadership group as well to to teach them through those. We've obviously had many of those in our careers, many ups and downs. So explaining what sort of that's like, um, what we can build from that and what learnings we can go from there. One of the great stories of last season was the rise of Matt Kuhneman as well and that sort of culminated with the uh, tour of Sri Lanka. Um, is there a chance that we could see he and Swepson in the same team, maybe in some of the matches at AB Field or something this year? I mean, how do you see that dynamic playing out? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we saw it uh, at Junction Oval um, the back end of last year. Um, we thought that was going to spin a lot, and unfortunately, it didn't as m- break up as much of, as we'd have liked. But um, yeah, it's um, great to see Matty Kuhneman coming through. I, I've played a lot of cricket with and against him now. Um, massive competitor, hates losing, and always bends the line when he tries to win. Um, it's yesterday we did a run of two tests, and there was all these rules and. Straight away, Matty was just a little bit further forward than everyone else, just trying to bend those rules a little bit. Um, but yeah, hates hates losing. Massive, massive competitor for us. And and Blood has timed really well with with 
Swepo obviously coming through and Swepo's done really well for us in the last four or five years. Um, but with Swepo gone, left an opportunity for him and he, he took it with both hands and made it quite tough for the selectors to, to leave him out a, a couple of games. Probably won't see him, we'll see us play two spinners if we get a sticky one at the Gabba, but um, potentially down in the Southern States or, or on border, depending on how that's playing. And I know you've only just joined the squad, uh, I think two weeks ago since getting back from the UK, but how's it looking and any other players that we should be looking out for this season? Um, yes, it's it's obviously really in, enjoyable being back with Queensland. It's a, it's something you can't really explain when you go away. It's like that Queensland culture, everyone sort of with each other, whether, whether that's literally or, or metaphorically, we always feel like we're going out as a, as a group. Um, ready to take on anyone um i haven't I've, i think i trained once and no one was really there um but i think i think bryce creeps um someone i'm really excited for um had a, had a really good year a couple of years ago and then last year struggled a little bit but um he's one of those guys that he scored 100 in australia eight cricket already um he's got a, a big future and he, he does such a good dog for us in the in the queensland batting line he's sort of doesn't take the the portraits that some of the other guys do, the, the Marnus, the Uzi, that sort of thing. So he does a really great job for us, and he's he's so vital for our, our team. When when he's going well, it sort of gives us guys in those in that middle order a bit of a break, and we know that he's doing a great job for us. So after last season, um, looking ahead to the coming season, what do you reckon would be a, a successful season for the Bulls? Is it is it all about titles, or is there some, something else that would sort of satisfy the group? Um, no, it's probably all about titles. Um, I think with with the we've won I think we've won two shields in the last six years, so um, we we know that we're there or thereabouts. Um, we probably last year we lost a couple of guys for the Pakistan tour. We lost a couple of guys through injury. Our, our bowling attack was probably a little bit depleted by the end of the year. Um, with, with injuries and with guys from Pakistan, so I think if if everyone can, can stay fit and um, and healthy and all the batters can be performing, then I, I don't see that us winning the shield is too far out of reach. Um, I think we were we were close to making the final last year um, until the right to the end. So we even we didn't really have a, a great year last year, and we managed to to push on that. We probably we were close to making the one day final, so I definitely think. We can try and make all both finals, and that's a, a successful year. And you want to try and get get silverware in, in the, the case as well. Someone who did had a have a great year last season was Grinda Sandu, and he's earned himself a Queensland Bulls contract for this season. But how do you fit him in alongside you know Mark Steckey and Michael Nisi? You got Xavier Bartlett there and, and James ba- Baisley as well. It's going to be tough to play all those quicks in the same side. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not a selector, so I don't have to worry too much about that. Um, yeah, he, he had a really great year for us coming in. Um, took a little bit of a gamble a few years ago to move up to Queensland and we're with nothing really. But um, yeah, he's, he's great around the group. He, he's great with his knowledge. He's obviously played a lot of cricket now um, and sort of he, knew, he knows his, his strengths as well. I think that's something he's really sure of, of himself and he knows what he needs to do. So. Yeah, it was great for us to come in and, and do so well. Patrick in the one one of the one days as well. So um, yeah, he put a lot of pressure on on those sort of front line bowlers if they came back. So it's gonna be interesting to see what what happens with selection. Surely you've just gotta have him in for the potential of uh, you know, getting a hat trick. I've never seen someone take so many hat tricks. Yeah, I don't I don't know what it is. Um, just seems to always get three wickets in a row. <laughs> And what about your bowling, Matt? Uh, any new deliveries or anything we should be aware of for the upcoming summer? Um, no new deliveries. Um, changed changed my action a little bit over in um, in England, working on some stuff. Um, when I finally managed to get a bowl, when when Pete waited 140 overs for me to bowl, and I took three for and five overs, I, I sort of let him know that I did bowl off spin a few times during that 140 overs, and I think he was just a bit sick of me talking to him about me bowling that he just brought me on and unfortunately for him I got got three wickets in five overs and 
then I have to bowl a bit more. Um, but I haven't. I've, I've changed my action. But Usman Khawaja always always hates when I try and change things. So I need to bowl at him um, to get his seal of approval with this new action. Um, but if not, I'll um, I'll go back to what was sort of working as well. Um, but yeah, he's. I think, I think last year in Townsville, I was I was bowling, and Jimmy Pearson came up to me and was like, "Oh, I think you should try and come up and over it." Whereas I normally just fire it in and see what, what happens with the ball. Um, Uzi took me off after that over, um, and I didn't bowl again for the next day. So um, we probably needed a bit more communication between the three of us, but um, that hurt me a lot not bowling as much. Um, so I'll, I'll have to get his seal of, of approval, um, but if not, I'll just be doing what I need to. But with you and Manus taking all the overs, there's going to be no room left for anyone else, is there? Uh, probably Manus takes more overs than me. Um, I'm now in double figures of wickets, though, so I can sort of say that I'm, I'm more of a bowler now. Um, there was, when, I think I was on four wickets at one point and sort of um, part-timer. Now I feel like a bit more of a, a bowler, bowling part <laughs> AB Field under lights, first game of the season for Queensland. That must be exciting to play there under lights and the sort of redeveloped uh, precinct there. Yeah, definitely. I, I've been down a couple of times now. Um, there was a couple of the, the Premier Cricket T20 match competition going on. So I um, watched a few of them. The lights look unbelievable. Um Looks like really bright, really great for, for cricket. The new precinct looks amazing. It's got a lot more seating. It's a lot more fan friendly. So um, I only realised yesterday that it was a day night of that first game. So I think we're really excited to get the get the season underway there and in front of a hopefully a decent crowd at, at AB Field. I feel we always get a better crowd at AB um, than the Gabba. I don't, don't know why. Probably logistical reasons, but. Um, yeah, it'd be nice to see a, a few people stroll in um, after work and after school, and just being able to come watch some some high quality cricket. Did you get to play any games in that new T Twenty competition? No, I I just got home from England just before that um, that weekend, so I didn't get to play any. Um, I would have played if we made the finals, but unfortunately, we we just missed out, probably due to rain um, and some results going not going our way. So if you are listening and you are in Brisbane, get down to AB Field for the Bulls' opening match of the season to kick off the Marsh Cup. Now, Matt, this coming week on cricket.com.au, we're running a series called Kit Week where we look at the greatest cricket bats of all time. So we want to know what's, what was your first ever bat and what's your all-time favourite? Uh, my first ever bat was a, um, a gun and more purist. Um, I grew up in, in Sheffield in England and Michael Vaughan was... Was there, so I think I think Dad had, had gone down to the shop and and got me the the full set of um, head to toe, arm guard, chest guard, everything that a six year old really needs. Um, and I think I've still got the, that bat somewhere in in Mum and Dad's house. Um, and my favourite one was I always Grey Nichols uh, Phoenix. I always every time Grey Nichols put something up, and they always um, they always go, "Oh, what was your favourite bat? What retro bat would you want?" And it's always a, a Grey Nichols Phoenix. So I had it with my second bat, um, and fortunately, I, I broke about a couple of years ago, and I was down at the factory, and I was just going through all the stickers, and I, I saw the the Phoenix ones. I was like, "Guys, can you can you please put this broken one with the Phoenix stickers?" So they got the purple grip, the purple stickers. Um, just absolutely pure. I've got that in my in my room, just sort of sitting there. It's my sort of shadow bat in that. But yeah, it's always that that I, I keep trying to get them to bring it back, but they sort of they go down other avenues. So um, I do have a, a predator on the go at the moment that I got over in England, um, which is also another. That's sort of my era of like retro bats. I know some people like Diamond Drive, Scoob, that sort of thing, but. The, the Predator Fusion um, Phoenix are the, the three for me that I just love. Nice. Do you have fresh stickers for this season or is it like a, the same design you've been rocking? Um, yeah, no. New new stickers this year, they're called the Nova. Um, similar to this, the stickers I had last year, it's just sort of changed a, a little bit. But 
Um, I know a few of the other guys have a, a couple more different style stickers that look quite nice, but for me, I sort of like a, a nice, simple um, design on them on my stickers. Awesome. Thank you, Matt, so much for joining us on the Unplayable podcast. All the best for this season. And, uh, yeah, good luck for the Heat and the Bulls. No, thank you very much for having me. All right, so, Jack, that was Matt Renshaw. Always a pleasure to chat to the Queensland batter about cricket or life or Harry Potter. Um, great to get his thoughts on the game at the minute. Uh, how do you see his season and the Bulls' season shaping up this year? He's a very funny fella, Matt Renshaw, isn't he? But the Bulls, yeah, they'll be in a strong position, uh, I think, for, for this season, especially for the first half when they've got their big guns in, in Manus and Uzi, Usman Khawaja around for the first four games, I think, until they have to join the test squad for the series opener against the West Indies in Perth on November 30. But they've got some depth there as well with Jack Clayton and Sam Truloff coming in and performing strongly last year. So I think they'll be around the mark um, throughout the whole season and potentially you know, pushing for that place in, in, the, in the top two and, and qualifying for the final. I mean, it happens every season, but there's going to be a real squeeze at the top of that order, especially now that Usman Khawaja is a test opener. So you've got Bryce Street, Khawaja himself, Joe Burns up there potentially. Matt Renshaw has been opening for Somerset, as we spoke about, um, and I'm sure there's probably probably one more I'm forgetting. But who, how does that all work in the first few rounds when everyone's available? Well, it's, it's four genuine openers, isn't it? They've got Street, Burns as you mentioned, as well as Kawaja, who did open for Queensland after in the Shield game after he came back in the Ashes. So, and Renshaw as well, who started his career as an opener. Um, but I think they'll probably go with Street. He's been, uh, he's a young talent, been promising at the top of the order and then alongside Kawaja as well because he's the incumbent test opener. So hard to go past those two. Manus obviously at three, you can't take him out of the number three spot. And then it's either between you know, Burns and, and Renshaw, if they want to play them both together. They've also got uh, Sam Heaslett there as well. Jimmy Pearson, they've got to fit in. So there is a real squeeze all the way down the order, but I, I think that's a good sign for Queensland and the depth they've got in the squad and obviously a, a good problem to have for selectors. Definitely. One thing we tried to sort of get out of Matt there, but we couldn't quite, was that the opening position for the Australian Test team in a year or two or maybe three is going to become a real question because we've got Kawaja who is 35 and David Warner who's also 35 so they don't have all that much longer left in their test careers and you would think that that would be a logical way to go if you're trying to figure out how to get back into that test team. Well that is the spot that's going to open up isn't it and he's right on the fringes there he was you know standby for the Pakistan test tour he was brought into that ODI squad on the same tour after you know a couple of COVID cases to a few players played in Sri Lanka uh, in the A tour performed strongly for Somerset in English conditions where the Ashes are going to be next summer 300s I think so you know he's he's right around the mark and it's just unfortunate for him that he's got the Australian Open and the incumbent one in his side and as captain for Queensland so. As he said, he's happy to bat anywhere, and I think that's what all players will say. Um, but I don't think a spot is potentially going to open up in the Aussie middle order anytime soon, especially with you know Trav Head doing so well in home conditions and Cam Green just dominating. So I think, yeah, opening is where he'll probably be able to force his way back in if he stays in strong form for the over the next few seasons. And it won't be easy to get a game... For the Bulls, if you're a quick either, I mean, look at these names here. Wildermuth, Bartlett, Baisley, Edwards, Guthrie's come in from WA, Sandu's got a full-time contract, Richardson's come over from South Australia, and Michael Nisa and Mark Steckity are, of course, on the cusp of Australian selection as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of names there to fit into what's probably three or four positions in any, in any given team. And we're forgetting Mitch Swepson and, and Matt Kuhneman as well, who potentially could play as well, so that would leave one less spot for the quicks. But, uh, yeah, we forgot to mention Swepson earlier, who you know has will probably benefit this season from you know relaxed bubbles. He'll, after two years touring with the, with the Aussie side, he'll probably get a full season under his belt for Queensland to sort of catapult in, or at least full uh, half season until the end of the Big Bash to catapult into that 
India tour, but yeah, they're another good problem to have with with the quicks. You'd have to imagine hard to go past Steckity and Nisa, considering they're you know in that group of six or seven Aussie quicks um, who have been utilised in the, in the past couple of years, and then it's just I think whoever's in in the best form after that. Um, but yeah, will we see? Kane Richardson playing red ball cricket. Um, he's certainly a specialist in the white ball format. But uh, you know, if he's putting his hand up to play red ball cricket as well, it might be hard to go past him. That's right. Adam Burnett wrote a really great article on Kane Richardson's move to the Gold Coast earlier this year. So if you do want to check it out, I'll leave a link to that article in the episode notes. And it might be a good move for him as well because a little bit more regular white ball cricket could see him extend his international career as well. We know he's sort of always around the mark in Australia's T20 squad and he'll be hoping to continue that uh, well past this upcoming World Cup. Yeah, well, he's, he's kind of the reserve bowler, isn't he, at the moment in the T20 squad when you've got um, Stark, Hazelwood and Cummins there. But, you know, he's been around that squad for, for a number of years and always performed strongly, performed st- strongly in Sri Lanka when he came into the side. So... You know, you'd have to think, you know, I'm not sure how old he is, might be early early 30s. Um, but, yeah, he's potentially got another three or four good years left in him and he could even get to the next World Cup, uh, T20 World Cup, which is in the US, I believe. So the Bulls, they didn't make the final of either the Marsh Sheffield Shield or the Marsh One Day Cup last year, which is a bit unusual for them. Are they going to hit back this summer? How do you see their season playing out? Well, they got ambushed in that last game, didn't they, against Tasmania at Bell Reeve, where that was the game Sam Ran- Rainbird took. What did he take? 15 wickets? 14, 15 wickets? Unbelievable. Incredible performance. Yeah, um, something ridiculous like that, yeah. So that was that cost them their season. But I, I think they'll be around the mark pushing, especially in the Shield, um, pushing towards that top two. They've got a strong squad. So, but they will be tested in the back end, the last four games of the season, especially when Manus and, and Usman go off to... To India, so that will be that will probably determine their season. You know how well those younger guys can come in and perform, and then they'll be relying on, you know, Joe Burns and and Bryce Street and, and Matt Renshaw to to step up and play those match winning knocks that those we know those two other guys can. So that'll be the big test for them. I imagine they'll be around the around the mark at the halfway point when when the teams break for the big bash, and then it just remains to be seen what happens after that. All right, so let's make your bold prediction for their season. Who's going to make the most runs and who's going to make, uh, who's going to take their most wickets? Most runs. Uh, hard to go past our, our man, Manny Renshaw. He's uh, in fine form. I think he'll continue that as well. And who knows if he'll step up to opening again once, you know, Kwaja leaves. So that would, I think, you know, he's well suited to that position, but, you know, he likes to bat anywhere. But I think he'll probably make the most runs and, as he was discussing with this, his white ball game has, has come on as well. He made 150 not out, perhaps, against South Australia last year. So that was a, that was a fine knock. And I think you know, he'll continue to develop that aspect of his game along with the T20 stuff for the Heat. So I think he'll be up there as the most runs. And then the most wickets, let's go for Mitch Swepson. Yeah, he'd be hungry to perform for Queensland after you know missing a a lot of games for, for the Bulls over the past two years. So I think yeah, we'll see him in in fine form in, in preparation for that India tour. Love it. Those leg spinners are always up the top of those <laughs> wicket takers chart. So let's hope that continues. Good stuff, Jack. Thanks for joining me on this state preview and we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you, Josh. Chat to you next time.